right so already a colorful skeleton and uh, we have got it more colorful yeah, with the muscles suprahyoid infrahyoid and the deep flexors of the neck okay the long and the short ones of course including the scalenes and the sternocleidomastoid so hope that session today was major it is important and emphasized on the landmarks from where to where their actions and the functional role of muscles and how much these muscles are important for various uh, dysfunctions or disorders as a applied clinical perspective right so we have done it now and Dr. Sharmani ma'am, usually she gives that an answer and then she runs away from the class. Okay. Yes? Yeah. Yes, sir. So I was really wishing, I wish I had learned this 23 years back, you know, <laughs> when I passed out my first year PPT. I mean, uh, so easy to understand. You know, otherwise we just learned Taurus, yeah, you know, and uh, names were given. That's it. But and this visualization, the yeah. Uh, <laughs> this way, I think uh, it's it's more. Um, we can relate the structures better. Of course, the colorful tapes, and uh, we can visualize. Okay, the muscles can be here. Even if we don't know exact point to point, but then we can still visualize. Okay, it's from year to year. And uh, yeah, which is very much needed. Otherwise, while treatment also is like what we do is gross treatments of the neck, obviously. But after the session, it's going to be more specific. You know, scalenes. Yes, we have been uh, treating when we treat, we differentiate the scalenes and we know. But uh, the suprahyoid, infrahyoid, and uh, we don't do all these things. We never check. Also, I feel. But today's session was fantastic. Feeling so confident, you know, knowing all the names and knowing from where they start and where they end. So that is something very important. Yeah. I guess I think Wonderful question. <laughs> the yeah, diagnostic and homohoid. Yes, of course. Yes, diagnostic and homohoid. In fact, so when you were talking about uh, diagnostic and homohoid, and you were telling homohoid, I think specifically when you mentioned swallowing difficulty, right? Last week, I had a patient of. Uh, Dry neck, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, not congenital. As you were mentioning, you know, he slept uh, at night with uh, the rotation on one side and the left side he had pain. Uh, the sternocleidomastoid was also painful. Even the trapezius was painful. But he specifically mentioned to me that swallowing is a difficulty. So, that I could, I was really, you know, like uh, when you were talking, I could relate that. that to the For such a patient, yeah. sternocleidomastoid easily will be. But it's important yeah. to stabilize the coracoid and then release the muscles here or mm. hold the mandible or the hyoid mm. and after holding the hyoid, release the coracoid. Mm. Okay. So mm. then homo gets influenced. Okay. Yeah. So I released. I release a sternocleidal mustard, but then now I can delete that. The same patient might have had a shoulder which is like elevated or oh, yeah. anteriorly uh, yeah. uh, dipping, okay, like that. So these are things yeah. which we might think that in uh, uh, this uh, terminology which I'm using, like anterior dipping and all those things. For physical therapist, so when you are examining the posture, position of the shoulder, so scapula going into where the coracoid process. Comes anterior and the inferior angle goes posterior. Right? Yeah. So like this. That yeah. is anterior dipping. Anterior dipping. Yes, he did have that slightly. So I released everything, you know, and then yes, it made a lot of difference. Of course, with all the techniques, whatever we learned, reciprocal inhibition and all those things and MFR. So uh, two sessions, he was maximally better. And then he told me this, you know, I'm feeling better. After releases, so now I can relate this. Yes, why swallowing? I didn't know that time. Why swallowing is affected? Why is he telling me that you know it's difficulty to swallow when he has a eye neck that way? 
So now when you talked about Omaha, yes, I could relate this better today. Very nice. And if that uh, situation is ignored, then I had uh, altered control because infrared is supposed to stabilize the fluid. Hmm. Infrared process. So high ad will be unstable. So then what will happen to the tongue muscles? Are swelling. So then they will have the problem of what is called as articulation issues or the dysphagia or swelling. So these kind of things. So it is like a combination, especially in a patient with the neurological conditions and disorders. It's very, very important. Okay. Uh, especially in the lower four cranial nerves, uh, the pharynx, larynx, and the muscle suprahyoid and infrahyoid. So you have a good role to play. But as physical therapist, unfortunately, the head and neck anatomy is limited maximum if at all, only the temporomandibular when it comes to the movements and facial expressions. Yeah. Even suboccipital muscles and deep cervical flexor muscles and all, not taught at all. Although now evidence is telling that they are stabilizer muscles, we have to know them, we have to train them and everything. Nobody knows even the name of those muscles. Okay. The deep cervical short flexors, which are the muscles. Okay. So, uh, it's something like knowing the name, knowing the action, knowing the functional role. And then uh, clinical evaluation and clinical treatment, it becomes a comprehensive role as a clinician. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. <laughs> sir, I, actually, I was not able to listen you, your voice. I am not getting proper voice of yours. Na? So, I was thinking it, it was from my side. So, Darshna ma'am is fine. So, I was thinking it was from my side. So, there no, is no, there, is, there is some noise, yeah. That usual, that fan noise which comes, no? It's oh, the same yeah, thing. Right. Yes, sir. Wonderfully, the functional classification of muscles. Uh, we normally we classified the muscles according to their structure, and but today you have shown the functional classification of muscles. How the particular muscles are going to work according the stabilizer to mobilizer, where the strengthening plays the role for stabilizer and the endurance. You have given a wonderful view of endurance also, how we can check the endurance and strengthening for the st stabilizer and mobilizer. Even as uh, in a practical examiner's perspective also, if a first IPPT student tells that sternocleidomastite is from sternum and clavicle to the mastite process, okay, it's more than enough. And that time, if you ask even where is the origin, where is the insertion, okay, as I was telling that here, distal origin. So, Tell that sternum and clavicle origin, mastitis insertion. Okay. So it might work. Some exceptions can be there. You can go wrong. But still, once you have shown the attachments correct, origin or insertion can easily change because functionally, you know, open and closed kinematic chain. Right. In the open chain, insertion is moving towards the origin. In a closed chain, the origin is moving towards the insertion. So if sternocleidomastoid is moving the clavicle, it is closed kinematic chain because it is origin. Origin. Whereas sternocleidomastoid is moving the mastoid process, the skull, that is open kinematic chain because insertion of the sternocleidomastoid. Right. So knowing the origin and insertion will give a clue next level to the biomechanical analysis, the higher step after the clinical and as we extend it to the pathomechanics. So open and closed kinematic chain because we have types of muscle contractions. As I was telling that the stabilizer muscles, minimal contraction, long period of time, they are stability, so they need not move the joint. So that type of a contraction is called as isometric because there is no movement of the joint. So stabilizers are maximally required for isometric contraction. 
or long period of time. But mobilizers can shorten contraction, can be shortening contraction, or they can be lengthening contraction. A shortening contraction which is against the gravity, concentric, where the insertion moves towards the origin. Eccentric contraction towards the gravity. It should not fall abruptly. So you have to control that. There also you need contraction. So that is eccentric contraction. So in the eccentric contraction, especially when I am weight bearing and I'm doing a push-up, for example, or I'm doing this and doing this push-up, elbow bending and straightening. Okay. So if I'm doing that, that means my hand is fixed on the bed. Only the elbow is moving. So here, origin is moving towards the insertion. Here, insertion is moving away from the origin. So these are all things comes when we know what is the origin and the insertion. But the general principle in extremity, upper extremity or lower extremity, origin is always proximal, insertion is distal. Whereas in the spine, including the skull and neck and everything, in the spine, it is axial part, the skeleton, origin is distal and insertion is proximal. So this, if we know that, and this also, if people have told us in first year PPT means, huh? okay, so <laughs> it is like, even for mathematics formulas also, nowadays they are telling so many shortcuts, you just add them and you will get that, uh, this thing right there. These things we did not know. You only know the other way, the complicated route of calculations and getting the uh, multiplication or divisions. Okay. So, this is what is clinically important. So, when I am doing a push up, means insertion is fixed, origin is moving because insertion is distal, origin is proximal in the extremity. But in the spine, if I am moving my body like this or moving my head like this, it is the insertion that is moving. Whereas if I am holding and then moving my legs or moving my pelvis, if I am clinging on to a bar, okay, and then I am doing that, then what will happen? Here origin is moving, not the insertion. Okay. So even lying down also, we can lift both legs up. That is, origin is moving in the back. Whereas if we come up like sit-ups, the insertion is moving for the rectus abdominis itself. Okay. So that is why the role of a physical therapist as a movement scientist the foundation comes from muscle mechanics. Okay. So that concentric and eccentric. Imagine a situation that subject is referred by an orthopedic surgeon, but the physical therapist talks to the orthopedician that here the patient is having pain during lifting the legs, not when getting up. Orthopedic surgeon will tell upper fibers of rectus abdominis versus lower fibers of rectus abdominis because they are more anatomical. Upper body you are moving, so upper fibers are moving, working. Lower body you are moving, so lower fibers are working, they will tell. But if you tell, this is concentric, whereas lifting both legs is eccentric, right. you will see the big difference. Okay, how the orthopedic surgeon actually looks at you. That is where your identity, uh, better autonomy, better interprofessional communication because they are not for biomechanics. Their biomechanics is only fixed to the internal fixations, how they can stabilize artificial joints, how they can actually help in the movements. So that is the only two... The metals, artificial structures only, mechanics only, they know biomechanics. Natural mechanics, physical therapist only knows. Okay? And the physical therapist should say that I am a physical therapist only if they can know all this. Okay. 
So that is how the comprehensive picture comes. We need not do an MSA anatomy to teach anatomy. We can go from the clinical perspective and relate the anatomy every time. Okay. Then physical therapist will be a better anatomy teachers for the physical therapy students rather than an anatomy teacher teaching anatomy. Because ours is not the mainstream medicine or the surgery where we depend on the cadaver. We ensure that the patient should not become a cadaver. Okay. So, and, and uh, life. Okay. So, the subject in life, that is more important for us. Right? Yes, sir. I think it's a very nicely you have explained that uh, with the movement you have explained the neck flexing on the neck uh, body or with the head so we can take the movement upper cervical and lower cervical then we can differentiate between the muscle and according to their name you have explained again the rectus capitis if it is coming in a lateral it, uh, coming in an anterior and the coli that longest coli with the services with the axis and the uh, capitals with the atlas. Uh, so everything, I think it's very easy to understand. Then for, then hyoid bone, supra, and then... Oh, yes, exactly. I know that yes. would have been your favorite, that uh, Kanyagumari to Delhi. Okay. <laughs> so, and thyroid is the center. And you yeah. have glycothyroid, sternothyroid. Very, very easy to... Yeah. Uh, very easy to understand and uh, learn the name of uh, specifically as you were uh, explaining. I am making efforts to ensure that uh, you guys should be able to remember these things. Okay. Yeah. And uh, if the videos are purchased even by a first year BPT, uh, they should expect that what questions can come in Viva in the, when they are showing with this anatomy tips. Very, um, very true. So, like for example, genio, genio hyoid mental yeah. genial glasses okay so <laughs> right. are easy to do with uh, the skeletal posterior same side that rotation skeletal anterior opposite side rotation yeah keeping hand on sternum then feel that sternum to thyroid then Record then stylo. So now it is, I think, easy to understand. And the last part which you were explaining was very, I think it's very important where you have explained all the brachial plexus and the uh, thoracic outlet and inlet confusion. Why we uh, mix both the terms that inlet and outlet if somebody confuses us. So it is now very clear why it is outlet and why this, the way is the same just divide the uh, vertebral arteries and the subclavian artery and then we can change the different and the main thing the patient feels that symptoms are the same the term is different i think it is a, a very important we have to learn it again for this uh, thoracic and the brachial plexus and uh, patient most of the patient uh, with the brachial plexus uh, they feel the pain in the swallowing it's very common from them and their, uh, their speech so sometimes their voice uh, is also fumble. So this is the all causes of where the arteries and veins are just, uh, I think uh, they are uh, giving the pressure all around the uh, all, all structure. So it is also very important how you have explained is like uh, you were... No, the, that only uh, comes in visceral, uh, viscerosomatic manual therapy. Yes, sir. The thoracic inlet release. Mm. Okay. Prior to giving uh, esophagus uh, techniques or tracheal techniques, okay. Mm -hmm. Thoracic inlet release, it is called as. Right. So, mm -hmm. but that ankylosing spondylysis you were telling about that how patient uh, feel the problem with their uh, sternocleidomastoid and the scalenous muscles they work and their uh, movement restrictions are coming because of their uh, joint movement are stuck. So I think it's uh, all these things you have added like in a sternocleidomastoid, even uh, that is a very, for the short breathing, we used exactly according to the example you have given how the people use the stairs and the lift, then we can feel the uh, how where these muscles are going to use and their movement according to anterior to posterior and the midline, how the same side lateral flexion with the opposite. That small, small examples are, I think it will be always stay in our mind that Yes, this is the scaliness. Even the other uh, situation of uh, people in extreme exertion, when they use the scalenes, after that you will see here, the full face will be like getting crushed with blood. Yeah, it happens okay. with me also. <laughs> uh, 
so then that happens that means it is because of what is called as the flow which is not there the subclavian vein okay so it is not able to go down the artery has come it brought it but it is yes. not able to go back the extra yeah. external carotid okay it has brought it but it's not able to go via the uh, subclavian internal jugular external jugular same way we have that into the subclavian vein okay there are only the branches there jugular okay like how carotid is a branch of subclavian jugular is the joining into the subclavian vein okay because after doing the exercise and something the work little's workout in the gym after that my face becomes so much red like that all blood is in all around in my face nothing is going there not through the heart also so that time i can feel now why today it means you are holding your breath and then working out okay you are holding your breath sometimes so that is the reason it will happen okay one more reason yeah i will check it again that why it's like you might I normally don't... you might breathe like uh, for example now when we are talking for one minute you might breathe uh, 10 times or less than 15 times uh, there for that one breath you might try to repeat three to four bouts of doing a workout yeah yeah it i do so yes. three to four when you do it actually prolongs the breathing in between that it is a breath hold so during that breath hold it is like the mobilizer muscles are forced to be isometric and um, they can compress the blood vessels okay and uh, they can also create that uh, flushing effect okay or the stasis yes. effect yes okay. right i hold sometimes i hold the breath when i do, do another one is the ac in the room where we might have clothing around the neck and arm and everywhere uh, but if the face is exposed and the ac is cold we will still get that for the temperature regulation the blood will be more in the face even without doing a workout and we are just looking at the mirror okay right mm -hmm. right sir very nice i think the people in the gym <laughs> half the time they spend looking at the mirror only okay <laughs> among that the half of them look at themselves other half looks at the other people who are working out in the mirror exactly. okay correct <laughs> so, very right if you look at the mirror you will see everybody in the mirror looking at you <laughs> okay so yeah. yes. they have placed this type of mirror up when whenever you will see in the mirror na you will feel yes you are bulky so that you will uh, recharge your uh, next session because you are not going to slim na so you will take another uh, uh, membership for their gym so they have put it uh, just this no, type obviously of obviously because people who work out that uh, for body and muscles also they want to be bigger okay yeah and redux reducing people they will continue only if they look big okay if they look slim means then discontinue the gym okay <laughs> once we are going for toning up the muscles even if it is not toning up they will still continue okay but uh, what will happen is Uh, they should see that uh, other people are looking at them or other people are appreciating them so that kind of things okay so they are happy with that but the obese people even if they are reducing weight they cannot be happy at all they will still feel that still i am overweight okay so for them to get motivated with the working you should actually show them that they are more fat so that they will take more higher packages and they'll more work out uh, so that you can get a better results okay right. just to do with the shape of the mirrors okay right sir very nice sir thank you so much again the anterior part of the cervical spine we have learned very nicely from you how we can differentiate according to their name structure and function so it's very easy to now remember all the name the muscles either for the hyoid bone either for the cervical flexors upper and lower cervical i may not flexors. take the remaining muscles as a separate master class okay so it may not be that half an hour of anything like that maybe 20 minutes okay then we might go on with the next topic uh, which preferably i want to take on the neurology um right. it is that full neurology okay 
flexors, nerves, nerves, okay, everything. Like we saw the brain, some idea. So spinal cord also, um, ganglia, autonomic, parasympathetic, all this, okay. So neurological uh, organization, the neurology, okay, orientation one. So that is the very interesting for neuro focused, okay. Yeah. And um, right. So before that, take a section on these muscles and then go to that neuro and totally complete it in two hours. So something like that. Right? Right. right sir. Okay. Thank you know that anatomy masterclass are actually one hour, uh, but with the discussions and the extension here and there, it will go um, because we are going at a relaxed pace. Well, there's no hurry. And we are actually bridging it with the cranial course, but the cranial course should not be getting delayed too much. So that is the reason. Um, I was actually having in back of my mind today that complete the posterior muscles so that tomorrow I can take the cranial. Okay. So, but still I thought that no. Okay. So you have got this information. You should retain. You should ensure that we go phase wise. Okay. And functionally also they are different, the posterior muscles. So we can take a separate one rather than overloading or rushing up. Okay. Uh, in some areas which are more familiar where uh, uh, for example, the course material videos, the neck muscles are only the board diagrams. Okay. So there's not actually much on the skeleton or on the subject. So then definitely this becomes a three-dimensional view and the study material videos become the two-dimensional view. So either way, neck muscles there, back muscles, it is called uh, off the back only in the neck muscles are coming deep, intermediate and superficial. Okay. Like that uh, organization in the study material videos, right? Right, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. So are we ready to close this session now today? Right. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And then get back uh, mostly tomorrow. And uh, my objective tomorrow is complete the posterior group and go to the cranial, actually. Okay? Right. So, but uh, are complete the posterior group and go to neural, uh, neuro means then cranial is pushed another day. Okay, so that's the only thing in my mind. Um, right, so it will be mostly like we'll complete these muscles and neural and see, take the cranial after that. Because uh, for the cranial mechanics also, we'll be talking about the neural implants, um, which nerves can get the implant. Anyway, cranial neuromanual therapy, we have covered enough and more about the nervous system, but still, it will be that initial part of anatomy, osteo, arthro, myo, and neuro. Okay. So all the four aspects covered like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So see you both. Good luck. Enjoy the evening. And so. Bye. Stay smiling. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am.